you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter 32. Genesis 32. And I want to talk to you tonight about running from your past. Uh, running from your past. And let me go ahead and give you the outline tonight. Number one, Jacob was alone with God. Jacob was alone with God. Number two, Jacob was tired of running. I don't know about you, but I get tired of running too sometimes. <laughs> I'm talking physically, uh, you know, how we're in a busy, busy time and uh, it just seems like uh, we are on warp speed sometimes. And number three, Jacob was changed forever. Jacob was changed, for, change, changed forever. Father, thank you for this night and God, I thank you for your word. And God, I thank you, Lord, that we can study your word. And Lord, I thank you for the Old Testament. Lord, there's so many great stories, and uh, this truly is one. And God, I thank you that, God, you can speak to us. Or God, you can change us. And God, I thank you for salvation. Uh, that is the most important change that we can make in our lives. So God, be with our Bible study tonight. And God, I pray again, as I do many Wednesdays, is if there's just one thought... One thing that we get from this lesson, oh Lord, I pray that we would apply it to our lives. God, we love you. We thank you. And thank you for all that's going on, the Awanas, our youth and discipleship, the men's Bible study, and uh, the other things. And God, we just want to look at your word, and we want to be challenged by your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the story, <clears throat> excuse me, in Genesis, uh, it starts back in uh, chapter 30, is about Jacob, okay, about Jacob. And I'm just jotted down some facts that I want to read to you uh, so I would not miss uh, some of the detail here. Uh, the young, Jacob was the younger twin of Esau, the son of Isaac, and Rebekah. Uh, Jacob later was known as Israel, uh, and he was the father of the 12 sons whose, family, whose families became known as the tribes of Israel. Jacob's name means supplanter, and uh, supplanter is a nice way of saying deceiver, okay, deceiver. So uh, wanted, I, I had to even looked that up because I forgot what it meant, uh, but it, it is not a compliment. I'll, I'll put it that way. Uh, and literally from his birth onward, he tried to supplant his older brother Esau. He first took advantage of Esau's hunger and made Esau trade his birthright for a tasty stew. Later, he deceived, deceived his aging uh, father, who was blind, into granting him the father's final blessing, which Isaac had meant for Esau. Esau, of course, was furious at his scheming brother, and uh, Jacob fled for his life. During his flight at Bethel one night, uh, Jacob experienced the vision of God's angels descending on steps to him. And some people call that the, step, the step, uh, steps to heaven. And his, it was his first awareness of God's plan for him. He, he was proceeded to Haran, uh, the ancestral home, and lived with his uncle Laban for 20 years. There he met a match in craftiness. Lab, Laban, by a series of ruses, married off both of his daughters, uh, to Leah and Rachel, to Jacob. And again, we're not going to take issue on the uh, two, two wives. All right, let me, let me tell you this. One, I, I have trouble keeping up with one. I certainly don't want two. All right, but in those days, it was an accepted practice uh, that they agreed on. Finally, outwitting Laban, uh, Jacob, with many members of his family and his large flocks, journeyed towards Palestine. Jacob, however, remembered his past injustices to Esau and worried about the reception Esau would give him. And then in chapter 32, uh, Esau comes to meet Jacob. Uh, he, you know, was, uh, had 400 men with him. And, you know, Jacob, I'm just telling you, he was scared. He didn't know what uh, Esau was going to do. And he just, he just thought, and one of the things he did do, he divided his family into two companies or two, two groups. You know, uh, Leah would go, one with the wife would go one way and he took another one with him. That way, if... Uh, Esau was really, really angry and was going to destroy part of the family. 
he would, that he would only get half of the family. So you can see, I mean, if, if you look at this, uh, in modern days times, it's, it's a soap opera as the world turns uh, with Jacob. It would just, his life was just one of deceit and just crazy things. So we get down to uh, chapter 32, uh, verse 22. Jacob was alone with God. And he arose that night, okay? If you remember, he left at night also. Okay? Why are you leaving at night? Because you're afraid, because you are in a hurry, because you don't want to, people to know which way you are going, all right? And took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed over the ford at uh, Jabbok. He took them and sent them over the brook and, and uh, sent over what he had had. And even at that, he crossed the river at night. Now, folks, I, I'm not real comfortable with crossing a river in the daytime, okay? But this is how scared he was. This is how much he feared because you don't know. You know, in the daytime, you can kind of pick and see maybe where it's a little more shallow or you can, you can find a way. But when you're crossing a river at night, you are taking big chances. So we understand uh, he, he really was, he, he was uh, scared and he was uh, alone with God. And, and that's, that's what the Bible says here. This, verse 24, and then Jacob was left alone. That was what I wanted to say there. And we'll finish that uh, verse in here in ju just a second. And folks, I believe sometimes in our lives, uh, there needs to be times when we are just totally alone with God, all right? I'm, I'm talking not just the devotion time, all right? Uh, because even in my life, you know, there's people around me all the time, all right? Uh, one, my wife is there. And again, I'm not saying I don't like my wife. I love my wife's company, okay? My grandchildren. And when my grandchildren are in my house, they are in my face, okay? They're jumping on my chair. They're, they're with me, and I love that also. But what I want you to understand, I want you to understand this from a spiritual experience. I believe one of the things Satan does to us, he keeps us so busy that we don't have a quiet time to where we can just be in tune with God, we can just talk with God, and we can hear what God tells us. And folks, I am telling you, the Holy Spirit will speak to us, but he doesn't do it audibly. So we have to slow down. We have to have our Bibles in our hands. We have to say, uh, Lord, speak to me, and he'll speak to you through the Holy Spirit. And I think part of this was God getting him alone so that, he could, so that God could tell him what he needed to do. Psalm 46. Look at Psalm 46 with me. Psalm 46, verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. Folks, being still is so, so important. We know God, but we have to spend time uh, with Him. We have to seek His face. We have to listen to His voice. Okay, and, and, and he will speak to us. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And I never have understood Christians that are in tough spots or something bad has happened in their life. And they blame God and just they quit going to church they quit reading their Bible. They quit doing these things that will help them grow. Folks, when we're in trouble, we need to run to God. We need to seek His face and listen to His voice. But sometimes, uh, even in, in my own prayer closets, you know, I, I have so many focuses on uh, who I'm praying for and all that I'm doing that sometimes I don't just stop and say, God, speak to me. God, just speak to me. And I will say, uh, this weekend, this weekend uh, was one uh, time that he did that very 
thing. Also look at Psalm 139. Keep going in Psalm, if you would, with me. Psalm 139, verse 23. Search me, O God, and know my heart. This is p- part of, of seeking God. This is a part of being with God. Search. And, and folks, I truly believe one of the hardest things we do sometimes is look at that spiritual mirror, okay? We have mirrors so that when we get dressed, our hair's in place. We have mirrors, you know, so we'll know, you know, if we have the, you know, are we matching? Is the right stuff on? Well, folks, the hardest thing is to look in that spiritual mirror and then quote these two verses. Search me, O God, and know my heart. And think about it, folks. God was trying to change a man's heart, okay? He was a deceiver. He had to run from his brother. He did things wrong, okay? His past wasn't a good past. And it says, try me and know my anxieties. And you could just plug the word worry in there, okay? Worry. And folks, worry gets you nowhere, all right? Worry causes stress, high blood pressure, uh, ulcers, all these things come from worry. And folks, we have to not worry about things. We have to trust God and see if there's any wicked way in me and lead me to the way of everlasting. And I jotted down this statement at the end of this first point. When we get to the end of our resources, that's when God can take over. See, we try to do it ourselves. We try to fix everybody's problems. We try to fix our problems. We pray, and all this we're trying to do, folks. But once we get and understand, you know what? I can't fix this. But listen to me, church. I know a man who can. All right? And when I say man, capital M. My God can do anything. But man, we got to slow down. We've got to listen for God. We have to seek the will of God. We have to be honest with him about where we are spiritually. Because here's the truth. You can fool some of the people some of the time, but you cannot fool God, folks. He knows what you're thinking. He knows your motives. He knows every word that you say. And folks, I know we're not going to be perfect. That's not what I'm trying to say. We as Christians need time every week alone with God. And God finally got Jacob where he wanted him to be. So Jacob was alone with God. The second thing I want you to see, Jacob was tired of running. And then it's, look what it says. Uh, uh, Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him unto daybreak. Now there's serious uh, controversy about, and, and I, I've studied this, I started a Monday looking at this, and basically, there's three angles that you could come at it with. You know, one of the, when it comes to man, it could have been an angel. Okay, an angel, which, again, I'm not agreeing or disagreeing with any of them. I'm going to give you my opinion, you know, when I get there. Uh, another one is actually Michael, the archangel. Okay, these, these were writers that are theologians, and they're a lot smarter than I am. So I'm just giving you the deal. And then the third, the third camp was Jesus himself. And folks, Jesus has appeared on earth uh, at times. So any one of these will be right. But when I look at this, and I literally ask God, would you sh- just share with me, what, what, what's this word man mean? And you think about it, number one, a capital M means it was deity. We know it was from God. We know it was sent for God. We know who, you know, and, and again, the second part of that, uh, Jesus came down as man also. All right, so in my opinion, all right, it could have been an angel. It could have been Michael, but I believe Jesus himself was sent down at this particular time and wrestled to him unto the breaking of day. And one of the writers, I just want to say, he almost convinced me all right, that it was an angel, okay? Uh, You know, as far as that goes, 
But the, the other deal about, you know, the man is, my thought was, the, the, the opposite part of that was, if Jesus wrestled with the guy, that wrestling match wouldn't, that wouldn't take long. Okay, so you, you can kind of figure out who, who it is, but I, I do think it was, it was Jesus. And it says, now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip, hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And again, because they wrestled all night long, uh, and, and folks, I don't know about you, but uh, some people, uh, I know this, uh, they wrestle at night, okay? If, if you ever, you know, look around and you, you see pillows here and sheets rolled up there, I mean, we're wrestling in our own beds all right at times. But this was, this was different, folks, okay? This was, was Jacob not wanting him to go, Jacob wrestling him. Jacob really came to a point of his life, okay? And I, I call points like this a defining moment, okay? A defining moment, a time where you can go back in your life and look at this point and say, something changed that night. And folks, I know we do it at salvation, but we do it in other times also, okay? God, man, he works us over. He, he wrestles with us, and we wrestle in our heads. Uh, we wrestle in our hearts. We wrestle with our bodies, okay? And, and there's nothing wrong with wrestling, okay? But we need to understand, uh, man, God wants a relationship with you to be so open and so honest that you don't have to wrestle with these things. All right, you will know God's will for your life. So the hip was broken. Uh, and then the last part of that verse, but he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. And really, folks, God had blessed him before because if you read all that, I didn't write everything down uh, about Jacob. He was a wealthy man, he had a big family. And looking from the outside, and you'd think the guy had everything, but yet, there was still something missing in his life. And you, I'm just telling you what I think was missing was total surrender. And folks, there's something you have to understand about running from the past. The past is the past, folks. I look at my life when I was in college, especially uh, 19 and 20 years old, and I went to church all my life, okay, and I just, I just decided I'm not going anymore. And I, I tell you, I regret, I look back on that time, and I just regretted that time so much. But when God truly got a hold of my life, I had a defining moment. And uh, the time uh, defining moment was uh, when I was cutting wood uh, on a Saturday, and the chainsaw slipped and fell, and it, 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 I cut my knee really deep. And when I went to get it stitched up and all this was going on, you know, uh, I, was, I was still playing uh, uh, competitive softball. And I couldn't do that for a while. And I was in the ER and the doctor had told me, he said, hey, if you'd have come any closer, uh, you'd, have, you'd, you'd have really did some bad damage. And I remember that night going home and I was laying in bed. I put a you know, splint on me where I couldn't move my, my leg for a while. And I laid in bed. And that night, that's what turned my life around. Okay. And, and man, I went back to church and, you know, you know, the rest of the story there, but it was a defining moment. And this, this broken hip was a defining moment in Jacob's life. Jose 12, go with me to Jose. Hosea 12, verse 2. The Lord also brings a charge against Judah and will punish Jacob according to his ways. According to his deeds, he will recompense him. He took his brother by the heel in the womb. And we know that is scriptural and that is in Genesis also. And in his strength, he struggled with God. Yes, he struggled with the angel and prevailed. He wept 
and sought favor from him. He found him in Bethel, and there he spoke to us. That is the Lord God of hosts. The Lord is his memorable name. So you, by the help of your God, return. Observe mercy and justice and wait on your God continually. And to me, uh, verse 6 is the key to what he is trying to say and what, what, what God is trying to do with Jacob. So you, by the help of your God, return. And I believe, folks, it's never too late to get your life straightened out. It's never too late to recommit your life to Christ. And sometimes it takes defining moments in your lives uh, to do this. Observe mercy and justice. And here's the problem we have. And wait on your God continually. Folks, God can say three answers. You've heard me say this a lot, but I'm going to say it again. Number one, yes, you can have it. It's good for you. Number two, no, you don't need it, and I don't want you to have it. And that's where that struggle and wrestling comes in uh, uh, sometimes. But what really messes us up is when he says, just wait. Just wait. You might have it. You know, I may give it to you, but you just wait for confirmation. And man, that drives most of us crazy. I believe sometimes we miss God, especially in our prayer life, when we pray for something and pray for something and Pray for something and we get weary and quit praying for something. And God's still wanting to do a work in our lives. He's teaching us patience. Okay? He's teaching us, you know, waiting on God. So, folks, never give up on a person. All right? I don't, I mean, you know, I could tell you in our own lives where we, we had to wait for God to work. And it wasn't in the timing that we wanted, but I'm telling you, when all was said and done, it was for our better. So Jacob was alone with God. Jacob was tired of running, and Jacob was changed forever. Look at verse 27. So he said to him, what is your name? And of course, he knew what his name was. He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. Folks, Jacob needed a name change. It went from deceiver, and when you think of Israel, you think of God's chosen children. God's chosen children. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And you know, there's going to be some times in life where you'll get in a situation where you may be the only one doing the right thing. Okay? Maybe in family matters, or at work, or, you know, in different situations of life. Keep doing the right thing. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we feel pressure on us. But folks, keep doing the right thing. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your, your name, I pray. And he said, why is it you ask about my name? And he blessed him there. Jacob got the blessing from God. And he said, so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. And what he's talking about, he is talking about a face-to-face -face meeting with God. Okay, a defining moment. A time when you knew it was God, you knew what you needed to do, and you followed through with it. And that's, that's what he is speaking of here. Verse 31, just as he crossed over uh, Penuel, the sun rose on him, and he limped on his hip. Why did he break his hip? I believe as a reminder. Sometimes God has to break us to use us. It ain't fun. It's, number one, it's not fun being in God's woodshed. Okay? He's worked me over more than one time. But what I believe for us really stubborn guys, sometimes he has to break us and just say, you have nowhere to go. You have nowhere to run. You're really out of options also. And folks, the bottom line 
is surrendering everything to God. I believe Jacob at that point said, okay, God, I hear, here I am, it's yours. And therefore to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in uh, the muscle that shrank. See, the pineal means the face of God, and here's, the, here's what's important, folks. When we make mistakes, the key is don't repeat the mistakes that you made. So many people, uh, what was uh, the definition of insanity? Doing something the same way over and over again and expecting different results? Okay, that's insane. And what we have to do, we have to come to the place where we said, you know what, I've been down that road before, and I'm not going to go back down that road. We have to learn from the past. And the other thing is, folks, we can't let the past haunt us also. Satan uses the past. He loves to throw the past in our face. He loves to tell us, you know, you are still worthless. You still did this, or you still have, you know, what, and you just fill in the blank of how you messed up. And I think we need to remind Satan, hey, Satan, that's in my past. God's already forgiven me of that. Folks, I am telling you, the first time you ask in sincerity, God forgives. But I'm telling you, he, he don't let up. He tries to remind us of who we used to be. One of the things that always scared me when I started preaching was, I was always afraid that some girl that I dated in college would be in the audience. And she said, Brother Mike, remember me? <laughs> I'm like, oh my goodness. And Satan, I'm telling you, Satan puts things like that in your head. And I just had to finally say, you know what? I am forgiven of what, forgiven for what I have done. And here's the other thing, folks. You can't change the past, but you can change your future. And I thank God uh, that uh, we have a future in Jesus Christ. Philippians 3. Philippians 3. Verse 12. Not that I've already attained, I am already perfected. Folks, nobody's perfect. Nobody has a perfect life. Everyone has sinned. Every one of us has come short of the glory of God. But look at this. I press on. And there is a time, folks, uh, when you make big mistakes, the people are just going to have to watch you, okay? They're going to have to watch you. They, they lost faith or trust in you. And all, you, you just have to keep living for Christ. You know, you, you have to just keep moving on and doing the right thing. I press on that I may hold, lay hold of that which Christ Jesus is a laid hold of me. See, Jesus has forgiven my past. Forgive my past. He chose me. I chose him. I, when, he, when, he, when he gave me that invitation, I said yes to Jesus. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. Now, folks, we know who wrote the book of Philippians. And we know Paul had a storied past, okay, He was a Christian persecutor, okay? His life as Saul was not good. But I I think this verse meant a lot to him. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. Folks, that's why when you're sitting in your car, your truck, the windshield takes all that you can see side to side, And when you look in the rearview mirror, it's about this big. Why? Because the past is the past, folks. Keep looking ahead. Keep doing what God wants you to do. Don't listen to those voices, okay? Don't worry about what other people are doing. When God tells you and you have those defining moments in your life, you pursue it with all of your heart and all of your life. Verse 14. 
I press towards the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Folks, you think about it. We all win. If we're Christians, we're going to win. And we need to keep pressing on. We need to keep pressing on. And that's just kind of the way I'm wired. You know, I had, I had a lady this week. I called her and was checking on her. And she was all worried about me. She said, you know, you got, you got really sick. You know, you're, you, I think you're in that pattern again. I, you know, you're, if you don't slow down, you're going to get sick again. And I simply said, listen, I would rather burn out for Jesus than just rot out doing nothing for him, folks. All right? I, and again, I'm all for it. you got to be sensible. But I'm telling you, health-wise, I feel like I am back. I feel like, uh, again, uh, you know, God gave me that time out. All right, I, I called it my year of timeout so that I could just keep running the race. Okay, just keep going. All right, and, and folks, I, I want the last years of my life to be the best years of my life. And I'm talking about ministry, okay, because I'm blessed anyway. I, I, you know, I, I told somebody this, I think it was yesterday, I think I told somebody if I died today, psh, I'm just telling you, I'm good. I'm good. Now, my wife don't like to hear that, okay, and I'm not, and I don't have a death wish, okay? I'd love to stay here. I'd love to retire here. But folks, I am telling you, uh, God's been good to me, and uh, man, he, he is leading me, and I just, I just love that. For the prize of the upward call in Christ Jesus. Folks, when you think about your past, you need to thank God for new beginnings. New beginnings. You don't have to live in the past. And the way to be completely right with God is total surrender. Father, thank you for this day. And God, I thank you for Jacob's life. And I know he had a, just a sketchy start. And I know he was a, a deceiver. But God, you did a work in his life. And it did take a while, Lord. Sometimes uh, it, it does take people a while. But uh, God, I thank you that uh, your word says, he that began a good work in you uh, will finish it. And so, God, uh, my prayer for us, even tonight, is for us to finish strong. Just to finish strong. Thank you for examples in the Old Testament of, of folks that didn't have that great a beginning. But, God, when I think of all, even your great men of God, Lord, uh, I think of King David, and, man, he had a past. I think of Noah. Uh, he had a past. And God, I think of Jonah, all right, running from you, Lord. He had a past. But God, you forgive, and you want us to move on, and you want us to get back to that right relationship with you. So God, thank you for being there. Thank you for listening to our prayers. God, I pray that we would get alone with you and just do business with you every now and then, God. We need that introspecting time so that we can hear your voice and know the will of God. God, I pray we'll be so in tune with you that there's not a chance we're going to miss the will of God. So God, thank you for, uh, Lord, just the scripture. And thank you for the encouragement is uh, you tell us to press on. You tell us to move on. You tell us to keep running the race. And God, I just... Uh, as, as my fellow Christians here, I know they say this too. God, we are going to run the race for you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.